Jane Merkley and myself put together a chapter for that compendium. And my background is in mechanical engineering, industrial engineering, and psychology. Her background is in cultural anthropology. So if you see some elegant cultural anthropology ideas here, those are hers. If you see some clumsy engineering stuff, that's mine. And the, the paper has a lot of neat ideas from her that I think are hopefully useful and different with respect to the ideas of culture and culture change. So one of the things that I'd like to continue on the theme that a number of others have mentioned is the idea of driving safety really being a public health problem. And this was identified over 50 years ago by Haddon, who declared traffic deaths to be an epidemic back in 1958. And I, I think he was really correct. And this energized a response to that problem, resulted in the creation of NHTSA, and a, a real focus on traffic safety. At the same time, there was the polio epidemic. And polio has been nearly wiped out across the globe, essentially wiped out in the US, but traffic safety is still a problem. We're talking about it today, just as he did 50 years ago. So what's, what's the, the reason for that? And I think maybe one of the reasons is that we're using the wrong disease metaphor. We're thinking about traffic safety as a epidemic similar to polio where there's a pharmacological intervention that can be applied. And I think that it may be more accurate to think of this problem more as a disease epidemic like obesity, where a behavioral intervention is required. So I think the metaphor is useful, but the specific disease we're using as an analog may not be the right one in terms of thinking about polio. I think obesity may be more appropriate. The influence that Haddon had through NHTSA on traffic safety was initially very much focused on crash worthiness. And that enhanced safety tremendously. But there are limits on this passive approach to safety. As you can see here in these images, speed matters. If you're going fast, the laws of physics rule and you die if something goes wrong. And I think along with the, the initial allure of safety that NHTSA brought out was the idea that you could have a crash without injuries, that you could protect drivers by encircling them in a cocoon of safety, most recently with the airbags, that would prevent injuries even if you crash. So the, the focus was really on crash worthiness. And I think that that led to a sort of myth that culture and behavior could not be changed. So the only way to enhance safety is to make crashes survivable. I think there's importance to making crashes as survivable as possible through the car roadway infrastructure, but I also think the idea of culture is critical and influences on safety very, very important. I think that this problem that we have in driving is similar to some of the problems that challenge other domains, where you have high hazard, low risk domains, high hazard in the sense that the occasional mishaps do you in. A nuclear power plant, for example, is high hazard, big nasty consequences if there's a mishap, but the mishaps happen very infrequently. In driving, at least at an individual level, it's the same thing. Any individual driver is very unlikely to be involved in a mishap that injures them in the next day, two days, two years, 20 years. And that same challenge of providing better, less diffuse, less delayed, more immediate feedback to guide appropriate behavior, I think is one of the challenges we face in driving. So the, the role of culture, based on what I've just said, you sort of have the core of physics. Physics matters, speed matters. And if you can build vehicles to be more robust, that's great but that's not the full answer. Performance of the driver is critical. If you can get drivers to react more quickly through collision warning systems, drive their reaction times down, that can enhance safety, but I don't think that's enough. You really need to worry about behavior and how do you shape behavior? How do you get people to drive more slowly, for example, to wear seat belts, to not drink and drive? Those behavioral components are critical for safe driving 
and those are ultimately influenced by culture. And I think culture influences not just the behavior of the individual driver directly, but indirectly it sets national priorities in terms of the safety of vehicles, the safety of infrastructure. And that's, I think, really, really critical. This is a, an intriguing graph from Len Evans' most recent book showing the deaths per thousand vehicles and the vehicles per thousand people. And this illustrates a couple of things. One is the huge range in the likelihood of a vehicle killing somebody. About a thousand fold difference, three orders of magnitude, tremendous range from Mozambique down to Sweden and Norway at the bottom. One thing that this illustrates is sort of an individual and collective practice with driving. Some countries down at the bottom have a lot of cars on the road, a lot of practice for individual drivers, and a lot of practice organizationally in terms of designing good roads. But some countries, like the US, seem to have stopped learning. We've got a lot of practice, but we're not getting a lot better, and we're being surpassed by a number of other countries, as we heard this morning. I think that's a big problem. This distribution occurs not only across the world, but also across the US. You have a a five-fold difference in crash rates between Massachusetts and Mississippi, for example. And it's not the crazy Boston drivers that are killing people. It's the increased risk in Mississippi. And along with this graph, you might associate that with the difference between rural and urban. The rural environment of Mississippi places hospitals away from the crash site, making it more difficult to get an injured driver to safety. But that doesn't explain the full picture, I think. I think part of that argument breaks down when you look at a country like the US and Sweden. Sweden being having a lot of rural expanses, a lot of the same challenges we face, but is a much safer society. And I think one of the differences may be not rural, urban, but individual versus collective attitudes towards safety and life. And I think that that's a challenge um, that's facing the US. And this is illustrated, I think, to some degree with the attitudes and um, performance of the US versus the rest of the world with respect to seat belt usage. In Australia, it's just assumed that people wear seat belts in the front seat. It's a given. Their focus is on the rear seat, almost to the same level as we are with the front seat. In the US, we've made progress, 53% in 94. 77% in 2007, certainly going up in terms of seatbelt usage. But that's a long period of time. If you look at Korea, they went from 23% to 98% in one year. Amazing difference. How do we get that sort of focus on safety? I think that's a, a really critical question. And the experience of France might be illustrative of how that might happen. Here you had greatly increased national visibility given to the issue by Chirac. He made it an issue of national pride. And they introduced a campaign that dramatically affected road safety by looking at speeding. The rate of speeding ticket issuance went up almost three times. They cracked down on drunk driving, seat belts, cell phones. And speeding decreased by 11.3% and the average speed by five kilometers per hour. A dramatic influence on safety, which resulted in a decreased rate of death of 32% and reduced injury rates by 29%. So I think when you, from the top, change the focus of the country to attend to automotive safety, you can see a big benefit. I think Ray LaHood has really made this um, the case, at least with respect to distracted driving in the US recently. And it would be interesting if Obama were to speak at the meeting in August, how that might shift the national debate on driving safety. I think it would have a substantial influence. So talking about driving culture, I think a definition is important. And Jane Merkley, the, the co-author of this paper, and I worked on this a bit, but this is primarily her doing. And culture, as what Nick showed, depends on beliefs, values, norms, and things, the artifacts that people use that guide social interactions. 
And the, the things part of it, the artifacts, I think in driving are quite important. This refers to the vehicle, but also to the roadway. And I think as a society, we need to take collective responsibility in driving towards safer roads. So it's not just the vehicles, it's not just what you do with your vehicle to shape that artifact, but it's also the roadway infrastructure. In thinking about this, we identified three areas where you need to think, I think, deeply about the nature of culture. One of them is the multiplicity of driving cultures. There's not just one driving culture. There's a, a wide variety of them. And we see differences between, say, Mississippi and Massachusetts, between countries, as you see, um, but also between teens and other drivers. And I think this brings up the important issue of the meaning of driving. Why do teens drive? And part of it is not for the transportation purpose. It's not a pragmatic goal of getting from one place to another. Chuck Berry may have put it best with his song, No Particular Place to Go. Driving for teens is a, an effort in self-expression, an effort to finding their freedom. And you listen to the lyrics of Bruce Springsteen's songs, and you get that effect very strongly. I think driving in the US has a lot to do with expression of freedom. And so recently, you've seen a substantial decrease in teen driving. They're not driving as much as they were even five years ago. And I think part of the reason the meaning of driving has shifted, and teens are gaining self-expression through Facebook, for example. So we might want to encourage teens to keep their hands off the wheel and on the keyboard instead, and keep them at home, connecting with each other, expressing their freedom through the computer rather than through the car. So I think that's one issue of driving culture that's critical. The second issue is the idea of that culture is a dynamic, contextual, and emergent feature. And I'll give you a, a concrete example of that in a moment. The last point, I'm a little bit at odds with Nick in terms of saying that uh, culture is best modified by changing social practice rather than changing beliefs and attitudes. And I'll give an example of that, one by uh, Schelling, who's a Nobel Prize winning economist, looking at hockey helmet wearers in the NFL. Everybody believed that they saved lives even after deaths of players. They persisted in not wearing helmets. The reason was that it made them look less manly. And one player was quoted as saying, if everybody wore them, we'd all wear them. And so that sort of chicken the egg problem, I think, can be resolved top down by changing practice rather than changing belief. So in some instances, at least, maybe more effective to change practice rather than beliefs. So what I would like to argue is culture is like a termite mound, and it's helpful to think of it like that um, for a couple reasons. Um, termite mounds are fascinating things that are complex structures that have multiple components, amazingly engineered things that emerge spontaneously, in a sense, out of the behavior of the termites. The termite's behavior is guided by the pheromone fields that are generated when the termites defecate. And those pheromone fields guide other termites to defecate where other termites have defecated. So those pheromone fields create an emergent self-replicating influence on the other termites. Those termite fields that are generating, generated and generating the pheromone fields the defecations eventually build up, and what that results in is the mound structure, that macro structure you see here, and that mound structure then in turn influences the behavior of the termites. And I think driving is um, similar to that in the sense that at the micro level, you have the cognitive components, here you have the behavior, and at the top level you have the structures that guide people's behavior, whether it's the roadway, or the, the laws and their enforcement. So I think that that idea is at least useful for me to think about culture as a dynamic, self-replicating system that emerges out of the behavior of the individual drivers, but also can be shaped top down. So I'll talk just briefly about four interventions that came out of this idea. 
a place-based intervention which focuses on the concrete physical environment, a cyborg intervention which focuses on the role of technology connecting drivers to their vehicle, to the roadway, to other drivers, and then a network-based intervention um, that looks at the interconnections between people and their multiple influences. And then finally, looking at a control-based in intervention that focuses on feedback and control at multiple levels. So the place-based intervention, I think, is really nicely illustrated by the cultures of states. Governor of Montana um, stated there's a myth in Montana that drinking and driving is part of being a Montanan. There's almost a, a pride to being able to drink and drive, or at least have the freedom to do so. I think a real problem in terms of the general attitude. In Wisconsin, similar problems with drunk driving. And this is a quote from a bar owner who's had situations where their parent was going to buy drinks for a kid who looked to be 8 to 10 years old. And at that point, the bar owner took his discretion and said he would not serve that child. It is legal in Wisconsin to serve 8 and 10 year olds alcohol if you're the parent requesting it. So that attitude towards alcohol is sort of special and needs to be considered when you're developing interventions. The point here is that artifacts affect behavior that affect artifacts. And so the circle that you see on the previous slide with termites I think also applies here and is nicely illustrated by the crosses at the side of the roadway. The cyborg intervention has to do with the melding of technology and people illustrated by this half human, half mechanical arm. And I think it has a couple sort of broad influences. One of them is to isolate drivers from other drivers. This is the shopping cart phenomena that we heard about earlier, where you might behave differently in a car in terms of passing and negotiation than you would with a shopping cart. And I think that's a, a very important influence. The second point there is that by accepting this agency of the car driver combination, it gives us new ways to change culture. And those ways, I think, will become even more powerful as the technology develops and you have connections between the car and the roadway, between cars, between cars and drivers. Vehicles will know the driver, will know when the driver has, say, been drinking. That information can be shared with the driver, potentially with other drivers. And the vehicle infrastructure in itself can shift behavior by nudging drivers to safer behaviors. A specific example of that is with adaptive cruise control. What are the default settings for headways that are set by the engineers at the factory? A safety-oriented culture would have larger default headways nudging drivers into safer following distances. I think these are very powerful influences that need to be designed in and regulated by the government to make sure that we nudge drivers in ways that enhance safety. The last point here is that we can use this technology to link to social networks that extend beyond the car. And this is a, a slide here showing how you could help calibrate drivers' risk perception in terms of the assessment of how cell phones are influencing driving safety. Here you have a situation where the perceived risk is disconnected from the actual risk and people as a consequence engage in higher than acceptable risky behavior. But through this technology that monitors the road and provides feedback, better feedback to the drivers, you calibrate the risk so it's correlated with the actual risk and the drivers work to bring those risks in line with the societal norms. That calibration, I think, can be extended through networks of people. And I think the, the idea of people, drivers not being individuals, but being part of a broader network is a very powerful one. And the actor network theory provides both the theoretical framework, but also a series of methods to really leverage those ideas to influence culture. And one example of that is that the network analysis reveals influences and potentially disease pathways. So in many networks, you have a few key people that are disproportionately influential. And if you can change their behavior, 
you can change the behavior of the network. And a nice example of this network analysis and disease pathways is given in a recent uh, article in the New England Journal of Medicine looking at the spread of obesity. Um, these are data from the Framingham Heart Study. And what they showed is the rise and the spread of obesity in that population. Green are healthy, normal people. Yellow are obese people. And you see over time, starting in 75 and going to 2000, a spread in general of obesity. But importantly, the network, the connections between people lead obese people's friends to then become obese. So if everybody around you is obese, the norms of acceptable weight change. And what you end up with is a network like this, where clusters of obese people come together. And I think the same sort of behavior occurs with driving. And drinking and driving is likely to be spread in a similar sort of fashion. So I think that there are some good opportunities to enhance safety there. The last point I'd like to make here is with respect to control-based interventions. And these ideas come from Jens Rasmussen, who was an electronics engineer, a controls person. And he looked at that from a very abstract perspective, not just control of the vehicle, but control of safety across the range from the hazardous process in driving, um, that'd be controlling the vehicle, up to the role of the government in terms of guiding safe behavior. And one of the things that comes out of this is that the government needs to have a much better sense of how drivers are driving and what's influencing behavior. I think that's a problem today with the challenge of making sense of crash data. We don't have a good sense of what drivers are doing and why they're crashing. I think technology can make that data a bit more precise. And then on the other side, providing enhanced feedback to drivers in terms of sharing social norms. The other thing that comes out of this diagram is the multidisciplinary demands of making this sort of system work. You need mechanical, electrical engineering, controls engineering at this level to put the right sensors into vehicles. And then up at the top level, you need public policy people, economics, and decision theorists. So this figure here shows how culture and these feedback loops interact to ultimately guide safe driving behavior at multiple timescales from the yearly timescale to the microsecond or millisecond timescale anyway. One of the, the, I think, promising things that comes out of looking at driving culture is that culture changes. Um, this picture was a bit of a scandal a couple of years ago. Child sitting in the front with her mother. 20, 30 years ago, this would be a good mother loving her child. So now, if you don't have the child in the rear seat in a child seat, it's socially unacceptable. 20 years ago, that wasn't the case. So I think there is a hope there. Just a few points to leave you with. First one is that culture is a process, not a static structure. So culture matters, and it can change. I think culture is a very powerful influence, and it's to some degree malleable. The second point is perspective that argues that culture is embodied in the material world and the control structures that the government puts in place. And that visibility of the structures, visibility of each other's actions, and the effects of those actions really matter. And one way to enhance the visibility nicely and concretely is the crosses that you see along the side of the road in Montana. Last point there is that technology offers many points of influence. I think as cars become increasingly instrumented and networked with other vehicles in the roadway infrastructure, there's huge potential for really shifting cultural norms. But we have to be proactive and take a very multidisciplinary approach to make that happen. I'd like to leave you with this picture. This is a very different view of driving safety than the one I started with, which was an Andy Warhol picture showing a woman underneath the car in a pool of blood. This picture is different in a couple ways. One is that it shows the broader roadway infrastructure. It shows how the roadway influences driving safety. It also shows how the combination of vehicles influences roadway safety and the drivers 
The other thing that's different is this one is a slightly more hopeful view. This is a Grant Wood picture, the guy who gave us American Gothic. And I think you can imagine that this driver may actually live. And with that hopeful view, I'll conclude. Thank you for your attention. You have to consider social, the social classes and the actual behavior changes. Yes, the social classes, the way I would fit this into the way we've been thinking about it is in terms of the multiple driving cultures. I mentioned teen drivers as having a different driving culture than others. I think uh, potentially different social classes would also have different driving cultures. The meaning of driving might be different for different people, social classes. In a wealthy class, you may buy a car as a social class statement. In another socioeconomic class, you may be buying a car to get you to your job, and that's about it. So it might make a big difference. Yep. Is it possible to make our car so sophisticated we can't afford it? Ah, that's a good question. I think that's a cultural influence on what we decide to invest in. Is it the social norm to spend an extra $1,500 in safety features versus $1,500 in the audio system? Currently, people are more inclined to spend the money on the audio system. So I, I think that affordability of vehicles is probably not the fundamental issue. It's a matter of affordability of what in the vehicle, and prioritization of options.